move to Rongui's talk from Huadong University of Science and Technology. The hoster will be Zhenghui. Max, your turn, please. All right. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Rongui Yang to all of you. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Rongui Yang um, received his PhD degree focusing on nanoscale heat transfer with Professor Gang Chen in mechanical engineering and uh, Professor uh, Madrid Dressel House from MIT uh, back in 2006. And uh, since January 2006, he started his faculty career as uh, at, uh, a Colorado Boulder and has been promoted to associate professor uh, with early tenure uh, in September 2011. And now he is a uh, professor at uh, Huazhong University of Science Technology. Uh, the the uh, one for ta uh, talk Professor Yang is going to present to us is the uh, scalable manufactured micro nano structured surfaces for heat transfer application. Uh, Professor Yang. Hello? Yes, yeah. Thank, thanks, Zhenghui, for your nice introduction. And uh, it's, it's really a great honor to give a talk here uh, over this platform. It's actually a pretty big platform. I just checked. The audience here is about 200,000 right now. So truly a great honor to, to give this talk. And uh, I, when, I, when I first saw the, the advertisement, it, it says emerging technologies for IoT applications. And I realized, oh my God, it's going to talk about IoT. I try really hard to fit, to fit my topic into these IoT applications. But uh, indeed, when I just listened to uh, Professor Raman's talk, I found out it's all about energy and uh, and temperature. Indeed, it's right on my own topic. So, so I, I'm going to give the talk actually on heat transfer, but in the meantime, as I mentioned, I tried a couple of days, try to fit the topic into IoT, and so you will see a bunch of the stuff I talk is pretty close to application side. Actually, my own background is really much on very hardcore heat transfer person, and it, it's truly just so more engineering and heat transfer. And uh, of course, I have background. Uh, I have a degree in MEMS, so I got an advantage in terms of both uh, heat transfer and the land applications. And I, I would just start with something really simple, as uh, as I mentioned, because I didn't know what the audience looks like, and I figure, I figured maybe introducing the basic heat transfer is the most easy way to start right so so i think uh, uh, many people know heat transfer because uh, we know the heat is uh, it transfer from one temperature higher temperature to lower temperature and then people know we use conduction and the conduction is usually characterized by the so-called thermal conductivity the take home message is the best heat transfer material in solid is actually dimer has a very high thermal conductivity, and this value is about 2,000 watt per meter per K. However, however, even though today a lot of people are interested in making in making synthetic diamonds for say for for electronics for thermal management of electronics, but they are not good enough. So usually people are thinking about using moving fluids, and that's called convection. Right? Convection is actually fluids moving around. Now, if we just move single phase fluids, essentially fluids just water by water itself, it's not good enough. So usually people use the so-called phase change. In other words, we know water has liquid phase and vapor phase. And if you can say have liquid and vapor phase transition because they have so-called latent heat, you can have much higher efficiency to remove the heat. And people make really say the closed systems try to utilize those to, to do the coolings. Now, these are the very basic introductions of what heat transfer do in terms of what heat transfer is and what heat transfer do. Now I have the second slide, the next slide basically showing what conventional thermal engineers are, are doing. 
essentially like a power plants, nuclear power plants, and those are all talking about power production. And then something like a building energy systems, refrigerators, and those are essentially how we do, how our career, our people are doing for, for, for the world in, in terms of engineering, in terms of making power delivered to you and heating your room and cooling your room, basically. Now, there are a, a lot of other areas also use heat transfer too, like right? propulsion system, right? So, so, so all, all the flights can taking off essentially have a lot of power inside and those are heat transfer. Now, if you look into just even new topics, say, say people talking about renewable energy, right? Talking about LED, talking about say new advanced vehicles, say electrical vehicles, they all have heat transfer inside. It's really important. Now, there are topics, essentially, what I try to basically try to articulate is so more uh, heat transfer, so more management is really important, right? Now, if we see a lot of news, actually it's the talking about electronics are failing. Basically, it's, uh, it's heating up and caught a fire, right? And uh, I think most of us have experience about also using smartphones and they become really hot during, sometimes you play, hard on playing games or if you have really bad habits like myself walking around on the road playing phones and because of the sunshine your phone usually are very hot indeed lots of electronic systems are very much heated up and really hot right this is talking about transportations especially like electrical vehicles defense electronics portable electronics and servers lots of them now I have this one, this figure basically on the right showing what's the energy level or what's the power level in terms of electronics, right? It's right now, if you have a stove, it's talking about about 50 watt per centimeter square. But for high power lasers, we are talking about thousand watt per centimeter square and its density. LEDs, we can also talk about thousand watt per centimeter square, 20 times higher than a stove. Okay, it's really high power and you need to remove those. If you don't remove those, essentially your electronics is going to be get burned and the reliability lifetime is become really low. Now this slide actually showing on the left essentially shows electronic thermal management. It's really important. And it's looking to really different land scale. It can be just on a chip, really small, and it can be on a rack, are uh, even as big as the whole building because the data centers has many, many CPUs in a room and you need to cool them down. Now it's talking about different power level and energy density. You need to remove those. And if we want to remove those, you need to play very really hard in terms of heat transfer. And this one, this figure shows basically what's the energy level we can handle. And what's the temperature difference? You can see, as I mentioned, if you have so-called single phase, for example, force convection, we're talking about tens of watt per centimeter square. Now, if you get into 100 watt per centimeter square, you have to use phase change. Essentially on the right side, something called phase change. It's really easy to understand. You boil water, it's called boiling, right? You sweat, it's called evaporation. In the morning, you see water droplets and that is called condensation. If you can combine those natural phenomena and then you put into a system, essentially those pipes, like what I show on the right bottom side, you can see those systems basically can be hooked into computers and then you can cool your computers. You can cool our electronics. And those are the things we do essentially is we try to utilize those natural heat for phenomena and we engineering systems and try to remove heat to make your electronic systems safe and work say efficiently. So this actually this slide shows some of my own research interests is uh, electronics and photonics. So more management for electronic and photonics. There you see a lot of heterogeneous materials integration. We look into very high end, very new materials. For example, graphene, right? Say and how they integrated with electronics, say Gallian nitride de devices. 
those those are the area we are interested in. The other one, and those are usually really high power devices, talking about thousand watt per centimeter square. Remember what I said is the stoves are talking about 50 watt per centimeter square. You need to remove very high heat flux out. The other part is wearable electronics, right? Very easy. We know we we have phones and smartphones. We call them wearable. We also can talk about smart jackets, right? Say, say I wash, for example. Those are all electronics, and that these two pieces actually present two different challenges for thermal management. In other words, present very really different characteristics for heat transfer guys like myself. So we try to walk through some of those areas and see how we can engineer systems and make those devices make work more powerfully, you know, compute more faster or more stable. And even though these devices or systems looks very really differently, now the core or the key is the chips, right? There are chips inside. And the chip generates very really high heat flux. What you need is you need to spread the heat. And this is one particular program I actually worked really closely with DOD about say, for about 10 years from 2008 until 2018 is on thermal management for electronics. And what I want to tell is on the top of this figure, top up there is a figure called heat spreader. Essentially, you take very high heat flux Right? And you try to spread it. Elo, Elo say for high power electronic, you try to spread it out. Or, or for smartphones, for smartphones, there are CPUs and transmitters. They deliver very high power. And you want to basically uniform, make, make the surface uniform. So light, you touch the surface of smartphone, you don't feel it's too hot in certain hot spots. Right? So those are, the idea, we try to spread the heat out and that's something called heat spreader. And what we make is we try to make those heat spreaders, right? Now, I, with those as an introduction, I try to say how important my area is. And then I want to introduce you a couple of systems we made. And uh, again, we, we made them for about, about 15 years and uh, we make different systems. And one particular system is for high power system. Now I talked about say evaporation, boiling and condensation. Actually my undergraduate degree is on power plants. And I truly like this figure because this tells, this tells you in a gigantic system like a power plant, right? It's, it's pretty big, it's about the size usually for coal-fired power plant, it's about the size of an uh, airport, right? Airport building at least. And inside, essentially, is a boiler. It has boiling, and the then you boil water, generally vapor, and the steam, it's called a steam engine, right? And or turbine, and then use turbine to drive drive the generator. You generate electricity, right? Then you have vapor. Basically, you have to dump the heat to the background, essentially, you know, say lake or, or to the air. Right? And this particular cycle is boiling, evaporation and condensation. And this is a huge device or system and they make power generation for our world. Now there are particular devices utilize exactly the same phenomena called boiling, evaporation and condensation. And you make them as small as a very small pencil. Okay, it's even smaller than pencil. You can make them into say two or three millimeters in diameter and in the size of say a few centimeters to say tens of centimeters, right? And then you can fit them, fit them into say laptops or in early days or even nowadays, use them to, 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 to do thermal control or temperature control of, of say, <clears throat> satellites, right? And this essentially is exactly the same phenomena, evaporation and condensation. And that's what I try to articulate. I work on the fundamentals of evaporation and condensation, but we make the devices because we try to make great use of fundamental study and then try to advance the technology. That's, that's the point I wanted to make. Now, if I look at this, 
right? Just say heat pipe, the so-called heat pipe. It's a pipe we can deliver very high heat flux and it gives you very efficient heat transfer. If you have the so-called thermal conductivity for this, you can have a thermal conductivity much, much higher than the natural material like a diamond. Right, diamond. I talk about it. It's about two thousand watt per meter per k. But if you make this because of this liquid and vapor uh, phase change process, we can make them into tens of tens thousand watt per meter per k. The key inside this is evaporation and condensation. It's liquid to vapor called evaporation. Vapor to liquid called condensation on a structural surface. A structural surface is called micropolis media, right? Usually you have thin-held particles or meshes. And those are the real pipes. And this has been actually being, being invented about for 50, 60 years ago, and has been used, as I said, in electronics and in satellite control. Now, look, the interest. The interest is making them into a flat shape, okay? Early on is on pipes. We want to make them into flat chip. Say it's like, like a planar device, right? And you want to make them a planar device. That's one idea. The other thing is later on, I'm going to talk about what really is called weaking structure. Is really those porous media and how water and vapor interacts, or liquid and vapor interacts with the structure and to make the heat transfer more efficiently. So we try to use something called hybrid weaking structure. In other words, two layers, okay? or, or your multiple layers. So light, we can take advantage of the so-called evaporation or condensation flat, which is the heat transport process. In the meantime, we try to combat the fluid resistance to make the fluid resistance as small as possible. And that's why we make hybrid weaking structures. Right? If we can make those, we can make more efficient devices. And that's, that's the idea. In the meantime, if we try to push your imagination, right? You have, you have pipes. Now, if we have them in, you know, right? And a planar device can be thick and a lot can be as thick as your smartphone. That's about five millimeter thick. And if you make it even thinner and thinner and you can make them into say potentially say 0.1 millimeter or 0.2 millimeter and you can basically wrap it up. Right? You can potentially wrap, it, wrap up and then make them so-called flexible. And if you think about those, you can make those flexible, powerful thermal management devices and you can stick to flexible electronics. That's, that's the idea. So what I'm going to talk is we try to make really highly efficient so-called thermal ground planes. Try to translate what we have in heat pipes to make them flat, that's the one. And then they can make them really high power then the other thing is we make them flexible or even say you can fold it so, so that they can fit into very high tech electronics. For example, people talk about flexible electronics. So this is actually on the left bottom part is the devices we try to make. And the, the, the middle one called vapor chamber is, is common. And then the, the right one is called TGP, a thermal ground plan. The reason we call them a thermal ground plan because we can uniformize the temperature. So light, the whole surface temperature looks similar and it's like a ground plane for electronics. So that's the way it's called thermal ground plan. And uh, I'm going to articulate how we make those. And uh, this actually is made and uh, it's commercialized through a small company I co-founded called Kevin Thermal. And we actually send many, samples to a lot of electronics companies, including Huawei, Microsoft, Google, and uh, UNJ car makers like a BMW indeed, and Samsung. So, so essentially, if we look, in, look back at what we do in terms of so-called weaking structure, essentially we look into how to manipulate the so-called bubbles, droplets, and liquid fields on a structured surface. Right? When we talk about so-called evaporation or condensation, they do not come with just a, bu bu a bucket of liquid or vapor. They always come with vapor molecules and then they generate so-called bubbles or just a few, right? And or you nucle nucleate a few liquid together, make a small 
droplet and the length growing to big droplet. And last essential part for the phase change process, they always have different phases, right? You either have a vapor, a small nuclear point to make a vapor, a small bubble, and then bigger bubble, and then the bubble just abruptly say, say gone, right? Departure, right? Now the same thing for droplets, it's exactly the same thing. Nucleation, growth, coalescence, and departure. And all this process, indeed, they are really closely related, right? And we, what we make is we make the so-called structural surfaces. Essentially, we understand, or we try to manipulate how the bubble and droplets and the films on top of a solid surface. And those solid surfaces are essentially micro or nanostructured because they have a size very similar to the vapor bubble or the droplets. And then we can manipulate them to make them move faster or slower so light we can enhance the phase change heat transfer processes. So these are the fundamental part. And the, what we do is uh, if we understand these fundamental parts, we can make so the surfaces. And the good thing is if you tell people, say I'm a heat transfer guy, and I understand how those processes goes on, a lot of makers, a lot of makers who can make things for you, right? There are people make millimeter structured surfaces, micrometer structure surfaces, or even nanometer structure surfaces. Over the years, about, about 15 years, we actually tested a, a bunch of different structure surfaces, right? The pillows, channels, matches, nanowires, whatever. And then we try to see how they can enhance the so-called boiling, uh, boiling processes, cooling processes, or condensation processes. Those are the things that we do. And we try basically try to do a lot of experiments and then try to say, okay, what is going on? And how you make the best out of those phenomenological findings or experimental data, right? So, so we try to, to, to get those understanding and then try to design those surfaces. So I'm going to articulate a couple of examples Essentially, we work together with different people and uh, try to get an understanding and then move forward to make a better services or devices. So this is a particular one is on, on evaporation or boiling. Right? As I mentioned, if we think about evaporation, it's really easy. Evaporation, you put water on the surface, right? And the water will basically absorb heat, yellow from the environment, or from the surface, right? And then evaporate, right? Let's call it evaporation heat process. Now, if you think about a bucket of water and on top of a surface, right? And the evaporation process itself is a surface process. Now, if you try to have heat being transferred from the bottom surface to the top surface through evaporation, if you have too much water, there are big resistance, right? So that means your water or your evaporation process is not efficient enough. Now, if you have too less water, it just says, just have a droplet of water on a surface, right? Out of maybe a couple of minutes or evaporate out and it's gone, right? No more water. So you do not have the process anymore. You cannot use that to cool a surface because it's gone, right? So what you need to do, usually is using the so-called structural surface. It's called capillary, right? A capillary to basically to retain that water or liquid. In the meantime, you need that capillary basically to, to move the water from the surrounding back to the hotspot. And that's really important. Basically, you need to have that capability. So what we do is, I think we try to learn a lot of experiment over the past 30, 40 years. And only recently, maybe over the last 20 years, we realized it is very important to have so-called hierarchical surface or two layer surfaces, like uh, what we show here. So you have, you have evaporation flat, you have very dense structure because it's evaporation, you need a surface, right? In the meantime, in the bottom of the surface, you need a macro structure. In other words, we call them hierarchical surfaces. And then you can 
have much higher heat flux. You can have better efficiency. And that's really one thing we work really hard in terms of making those surfaces have hierarchical surfaces. Then on top of that surface, you can manipulate, say, how the water interacts with the surfaces. They can be so-called hydrophobic or hydrophilic. In other words, called, say, if you have water called water heating or water like surfaces. And all those, you can basically change the characteristics. Now, there are other things, other phenomena. And this is very different phenomena from, from evaporation. Evaporation, we think about sweating. Essentially, you have, you have water and it's moving. Basically, it, the, the vapor plant is moving very slowly. Right? Now there's another process called boiling. And if you cook, cook, if you cook, right? You don't cook water or cook your food, you know boiling. Boiling is very dynamic bubble process. You have bubblings, right? And those bubbles actually is very important in terms of removing heat from your stove, right? From your stove surface so that your stove surface is not burned out because they have all heat basically is trying to to cook your food. Now, people have been working very really hard in terms of trying to basically articulating or try to design these two surfaces to make best use of this called evaporation and boiling process to have better heat transfer capability. The problem, the true problem, if I look back what we did before and only the recent years, we realized that People usually engineering evaporation process or boiling processes in very different categories. Or in other words, in two different phenomena, because one is talking about just evaporation, the other is just talking about boiling. And then recently we come up with a way to think about this problem is to say, why don't we try to engineer the structure and think about making good use of surfaces and try to have this capillary evaporation and boiling in the same structured surface. And this is actually a particular articulation of the surface we try to make. It's a multiple layer of mesh. In the title, I have something called scalable manufactured uh, surfaces. If I tell you it's mesh and you stack the mesh together, you can always stack a mesh together and then stack a lot of them, and that's called scalably manufactured. Okay. Now the key, the key is how we utilize the phenomena, so-called evaporation. It's on the top of the surface, on the surface front, and then the other thing is boiling, nucleate boiling, on the bottom part of the match. And it, because we are able to make multiple layer matches together, and we are able to design the processes, we make them. Evaporation and boiling, which usually happens in two, the, or people usually engineer them in two different categories. We try to put together, and we put together in a phenomena something called a liquid film boiling. In other words, in this match, we can boil water, right? And the water is boiled inside, and we can have bubbles moving. So in the right figure, I show. Say so basically, I have one layer of mesh, two layer of mesh, three and four layers, and only if you have multiple layers, say three layers or four layers of mesh, we can have evaporation and nuclear boiling happening at the same same time. And because of that phenomena, we have much better or much higher heat transfer capability than just one single layer or two layer, right? One layer is pure evaporation. As I mentioned, evaporation, you have, you have thinner layer of liquid. Essentially, you have higher heat transfer coefficient. Unfortunately, it cannot have enough power to cool. So you have, if I do this, I can have multiple layers and I can have much higher heat flux. It can, it can, it can handle. And that's, that's one thing we, we work on is we try to make say different surfaces and try to have higher cap capacity to handle the heat. Now we also work on this and we, as I mentioned, I, I, my background is MEMS indeed, a little bit on MEMS. And you can try to think about meshes and stack all those meshes together. Now, 
different sizes of meshes stacked together, you can create some micro channels and it's in vertical direction. In other words, if I have a bubble being generated in the bottom part of the match, and if I have a channel like what I show here, it can guide the bubble to move up, right? In other words, if the bubble is stuck inside, it does not, it basically is, is, is not smooth enough. Now, if I have bubbles can be guided out, it can have handle much higher heat flux. Only everything we do here is we try to have surfaces so light, they can handle much higher heat flux or much higher energy flux because we know high power electronics, we are talking about say several hundred or thousand watt per centimeter square. And if we do not have proper surfaces, anytime you put electronics on top of any surfaces, it can burn out. That's the idea. We try to increase it, right? Now, what we do is we engineer those surfaces. We are able to handle much higher uh, energy flux. That's, that's the bottom line or uh, the easy way I can tell everybody here because I know most of you are not heat transfer guys, right? Now, if I, I can make them, so what we can think about is if we, we have less surfaces, right? And uh, the figure here basically showing if I can have just random structure or I have a guided surface, we can guide the bubbles, we can have much higher the heat transfer capability than just without loss guiding, right? Now, everything we do is essentially we try to work on a surface. A surface we try to put in a way like what we want to do, right? And all everything, all the things we try to do is we try to use those structured surface to manipulate, say, bubbles, vapor flange, and droplets, essentially. Now, if we have those as very good heat transfer surfaces, we can try to think about making devices essentially. So this, this one basically showing, showing if I have so-called capillary evaporation right? and the capillary evaporation, as I mentioned before, people are really interested in making capillary evaporation surfaces because you can use them to make so-called heat pipes or heat spreaders or thermal ground plates or vapor chambers, right? Now I basically summarize what have been done in terms of different structured surfaces, right? There are things called sintered couple powder. There are bipolar sintered couple powder. There are micro post CNT covered micro glues, everything, right? And it's all called capillary evaporation. Now, if I have a new mechanism, like what I just tell you, it's called liquid film boiling, essentially have multiple layer of meshes and I can design those structure and so that it can have evaporation and boiling happen in a coordinated way, in a nice way, they can increase the heat transmission. And actually, if you see here, if I have heating area, which is about say 10 millimeters square or something, we can end up with about 1 million watt per, cent, uh, per meter square per K in terms of heat transfer coefficient. In other words, about a couple of times, or three, four times as what we know in terms of capillary evaporation. Of course, all these are experimental data. We compare with what we have and what we can find in terms of the so-called best data. Of course, this, was, this data was collected about a year ago and, uh, and uh, this field is really dynamic. Actually, everybody is trying to move the flange and uh, it can be some data we don't collect on this figure. Now, now what I just tell you is, in terms of say phase change heat transfer process, we want to have very high heat transfer coefficient. In the meantime, we also want to have very high heat transfer capacity, which is the power level we can deliver. Now we can use these surfaces, we can make devices and we can make these devices for high power electronics, right? Like, uh, like IGBTs for, for electrical vehicles. That's, 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 that's the final product we want to make. We not only just talking about say the surfaces. So we make devices. Now, these are the devices we, we try to make. What we have is we have 
two pieces of couple plates, right? And on each piece of couple plates, we make the surfaces as what I just told you. Basically, we make structural surfaces and then we assemble those together, assemble those together into a nice square or a nice rectangular. And they are usually one millimeter thick. So why we have one millimeter thick or half millimeter thick or say 10 centimeters, say, 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 say even that point 0.1 millimeter thick. There are very different characteristics in terms of heat transfer capability because how thick they are, it means how much vapor space you have and what's the capability there. Now, in this particular slide, I talk about one millimeter thick ones. And uh, if we make loads, and we can see how, how, uh, what is the heat transfer characteristics? In other words, how much power they can handle in terms of how high power electronics. We test the loads, right? We make all different sizes. In other words, we put a couple place, we weld them together or sort of them together, and then we hermetic seal it essentially, then we uh, vacuum it. And then we put water back in and make those processes like evaporation or condensation inside this place. It's all inside. You cannot see water outside anymore. Okay. And because these are inside now, you can make into integration and integrate into electronics. Now we test them in the right figure, basically try to put heater in and you have heat, then you have say cooling down and you can test say what's the performance look like. Now, these are the device we test them. And if we have left side, we call evaporator region, and then the right side, uh, we call condenser region. Depending on how heat is injected in, right? If you inject in a very small area, say, for example, we call 10, cent, the 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter, you can inject a lot of higher heat, uh, a higher power in, right? Because of the area, poor area, it's always talking about poor area, right? If you have much larger area, you can have, say, less power, basically, right? Less power density, in other words. Now, we can look into what's the performance look like, right? And this blue curve or blue dots basically show you have a copper plate. I forget to mention copper plate. Copper has a thermal conductivity about 400 watt per meter per K. And copper is almost the best, the best, Heat sink material is heavy and it's expensive reasonably. It's not as expensive as diamond. So it has 400, diamond is 2000, right? Aluminum is about two or 300 watt per meter per K. And then you have something, the inverse it is called thermal resistance. And if you have copper, you have a thermal resistance testing on the same device about 0.9 K per watt, right? And if we have my device you put in, you can see it's about 0.09. It's like essentially, essentially, if we look into the so-called if we equivalent, equivalent thermal conductivity, it's about 10 times of copper. It's much higher than diamond. Right? So that's that's the device we make. And we can try to use those to do the thermal management, basically. Now on the right hand side, it's talking about how much power we can handle. As I mentioned earlier, if we make them really small, right? And uh, right now people are talking about thousand watt per centimeter square for, for example, laser spots, right? If you have lasers and you heat it up or for very high power electronic, fast electronics, but usually are in a very small area, one millimeter by one millimeter or even less than that, right? Now I tested our device. If I have a five by five millimeter area, we can handle 400 or 500 watt per centimeter square. And if we make them even smaller, say one millimeter by one millimeter, we can easily handle 2000 watt per centimeter square. And that's what we can do in terms of high power electronics. We can handle very really good uh, heat flux. Now we can also come back to what's the thermal conductivity, right? And we can basically, as I mentioned, if we make them thicker, you have you have more water inside or more vapor space. You can have higher the so-called heat flux you can handle, right? And that's that's the one. And the other thing is you can have thermal conductivity. 
you can have effective thermal connectivity. This slide basically shows what we make and how they compare with the so-called state of the art. Right? You can look into very different thickness of the devices, one millimeter, two millimeter, and three millimeter. And people look into say 6,000 watt per meter per K, three times of diamond, or let's say 10,000, five times. And this star, the star is what we make, right? And we can make into about 15,000, 15 to 16,000, essentially eight times of diamond in terms of thermal connectivity. And we can handle pretty high heat flux. Right? So those, those are the data basically showing we are able to handle very really high heat flux. Now, now this is on one particular topic, as I mentioned for high power electronics. There are interests in terms of say mobile systems. And as I mentioned, when I make the slides, I try to fit into the advertisement. It's IoT, right? IoT, the easy way to think is right now, I believe everybody in the audience carry a smartphone. And the smartphone is the easiest IoT device you can think. So, so I'm looking into make the so-called thermal ground planes or heat splitters for mobile systems or for Right. So when, when we talk about smartphone, first, first of all, smartphones having much less power consumption. Usually we talk about three watt only, three watt, instead of talking about thousands of watts for high power electronics or, or, or loads, right? It's usually it's much less heat flux as well. Not only total power, but also less heat flux. But it's a unique challenge because because all those wearables or mobile systems, you carry it. You carry it because your hand is going to touch it, right? You want it, you want to touch it so that you can have a sensitivity on it. Now, because of that, you have a unique challenge since your skin got to get burned if your temperature the surface temperature is higher than 45 degrees C. For electronics, when we talk about Gallium nitride devices, we are talking about 100, watt, 100 degrees C, and it's going to work well. For silicon devices, it's going to 80 degrees C, it works, right? Now, for smartphones, because it touches you, or you touch it, you're talking about 45 degrees C. So, so we got to be really careful about those. It's, it's much lower temperature, right? Now, the other thing is, it's really limited space. Otherwise, it's not called mobile systems because you want to carry it. You don't carry a big laptop and you say, okay, this is something I can wear. It's not wearable, right? So, so those are unique challenges. In other words, you have a limited space, limited weight and the temperature limit is going to be smaller, right? And I, I also show you something different is about battery power. Battery, you also need to keep them very low temperature too, 62 degrees C, right? Right now we also talk about 5G. 5G smartphones is going to be more powerful. And when you have powerful computing means you dump in more energy. And because you dump in more energy for calculation, you have to extract those waste heat out. And the laws are unique challenges for smartphones. The good thing is, if you look at the right part, it's a smartphone. We break it, and you can see something called heat spreader. And essentially, it's a heat pipe. It's a heat spreader, a heat pipe. It's something just like what I just showed you, but it's thinner. It's much thinner than one millimeter, right? And in the bottom, you see layer is called good and bad. Why is bad is because you see some shining points. And that shining point is because the temperature is not uniform, right? We want to make a surface of smartphone as uniform temperature as possible. And we need to use low so-called thermal ground planes or heat spreaders to spread it out and spread it out in an environment which doesn't have the second system to cool it. And usually it dump energy directly to the environment through natural convection, either through the backside of your 
smartphone or the flat side, and usually is on, a, on both sides. Now, what we do, we basically use those, right? It's called vapor chambers or heat spreaders. And the list I show you one system is commercially available. It's made by Delta Fan. And this, this is a Taiwanese company. They supply this to a lot of electronics companies, so including, including Intel, including Microsoft, including Samsung. Both stop, actually. Now, if you look at this, I have a couple of lines there. And this one called thickness, 0.35 millimeter. Right. Early on, I talk about thicker ones, one millimeter, because I want them high power. Right now, we think about smaller one, thinner one, because it's a mobile system. We have smaller power to handle, but in the meantime, we have smaller spaces, thinner, and we want them lighter. Basically, that's, that's the key idea. We have a problem statement is we want to make some more management for smartphones. It must be uniform temperature in the meantime, might be smaller and light and thin, right? So we try to make them as thin as possible because only on, we are talking about right now, we are talking about four to five millimeter thick phones, smartphones. People are interested in getting them even more smaller, okay? Actually about 15 years ago, when we try to predict the future of the smartphones, okay? I and my colleagues were predicting to make them really flexible is something looks like a credit card. Right, and actually, there are technologies moving forward a lot. If people can make good batteries, a lot. Okay, so let's let's the idea make it thinner. Right now, we make those thin devices is the same thing, the same situation or the same technology, right? Similar at least the hardcore part is we make something called weakened structures or the structured surfaces, but we make those structured surfaces through through a technology, and that technology is truly scalably manufacturable. Uh, you can make a large quantity. It's called flexible printed circuit technology. Right? You know, flexible printed circuits. The most important thing is there are couples as a substrate, copper and polymers. Okay, and they put together and they make them flexible. Right. So what we make is we use those flexible printed circuits make two substrates. One is called liquid substrate, essentially micro pillars or channels and a vapor substrate, bigger, bigger, bigger channels or bigger pillars because one liquid expand into vapor, you need more space, right? And the length in between you have mesh, right? As a separator and the mesh on top of of micro channel is a hybrid weakening structure, right? Now, then on, the, on the top of this figure, basically it's showing a device. And this device essentially is the same device or similar in terms of form factor. It's a similar device as I just showed you before. It's, it's also called a uh, flexible circuit or flexible, uh, flexible circuit based thermogram plane. Okay, the good thing is they are flexible and we can make them really thin. I can show you how thin they are. Now this one is a particular one we made is 10 centimeter by five centimeter by 0.3 millimeter. And if you have smartphones, this is about a smartphone size, right? And 0.3 millimeter. Now, if you have a heater, if you have a heater and the length you, you pump the heat in is like here, I show 13 watt or three watt, right? And the length we measure the temperature on the other side. And then you see inside, remember, is evaporation and condensation. It's a liquid vapor, vapor liquid phase change process. And they do crazily inside. But the outside, you can look into the temperature at a different location, are pretty uniform. It's really uniform. You can handle three watt or 13 watt. Okay, that's the magic part of this device. It looks like a piece of copper and they can uniform the temperature and you can insert this for electronics, basically. Now, people talking about thermal management for electronics, especially for smartphones, right? 
And I believe everybody remember Huawei advertisement. Huawei's advertisement for Mac 20. I actually have a Mac 20 Pro here. And, uh, and the advertise was the server management inside. It's a heat pipe plus graphite. Right? Early on, people also talking about graphite. Now we try to compare. So at least from my point of view, graphite plus heat pipe is, is an intermediate solution for thermal management. It's not a final. In other words, in the future, the graphite and heat pipe together as an assembly have to be replaced by either a better material or a better system or device. Now, I compare here, it's a graphite and a device like what I have in terms of thermal ground plane. And I use my characteristics and I put in, put in say, the power inside. I forget how much, how many watt I put in. I believe it's about about five watt or something, and it's the similar similar power as what we have in smartphones. And if you have graphite, you see the temperature uniformity layer is sixty to seventy degrees C, seventy six degrees C. Right? And if I put in into my thermal ground plane, it's sixty four to sixty seven degrees C. In other words, the temperature is much more uniform using using these devices. Okay, it's better. It's better than graphite. The reason it's better than graphite is because our effective thermal connectivity is talking about 6,000 or more, much higher than graphite, which is talking about 1,500. Now, we can put this in, into devices, right? And uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, actually Galaxy, actually Samsung Galaxy Note 10, Plus 5G, they use this. They already use vapor chamber and that's on the left side. Basically it's 0.35 uh, millimeter thick, right? Now, what we are interested in is we actually make uh, the, the devices uh, performs much better than what we have in terms of in the market, commercial, commercial ones. So we are interested in actually making them into even thinner ones, right? We believe making thinner ones would, uh, would, uh, would better say what we have in terms of thermal management. And this one actually is made by Foscom. It's, it's a pretty big company uh, we collaborated with. Actually, uh, we call invest and, uh, and uh, we, we make those and uh, it's, it's in mass production. And uh, we have actually a technology map. Basically, the idea is try to make them into 0.15 millimeter thick and uh, try to actually we send a, I believe last month we sent uh, 2,000 pieces to different uh, smartphone makers to test those. So this one is uh, is a device. It's 0 0.15, 0 0.15 millimeter, and uh, we can handle actually seven watt power, and seven watt power, and uh, you can see the comparison on the right uh, on the right side. The comparison is is if I have our device. And we have graphite, and the comparison is the template is much uniform in using our vapor chamber. Okay, that's the one. And the other thing, the other thing is we have a equivalent thermal conductivity about six thousand watt per meter per k. Okay, and uh, this one basically shows pretty good comparison. And importantly, they also because they are very thin. Right, is liquid and vapor inside and very thin, and uh, each side is twenty five micron thick copper, and you can make them basically you can you can wrap a little bit, okay, you can fold it. It's not just sharp wrap, and uh, you can fold it. Now we also use use polymer surfaces to make to make devices, and you can flap it or fold it. And this one actually shows you a few devices we made before actually is using plastics and inside of those plastics are a lot of mesh structure. And if you enclose them and you can make devices and you can show basically what is the heat transfer capability. Okay, you have something called thermal resistance. And if you remember this number here, it's couple reference, the red line, and it's much larger than the early on I talk about 0.9 is because it's different size. 
when you talk about thermal resistance, it's always size dependent, right? The key part is when we make the devices and we can flex into different angles, okay, the flex angle does not change much about the performance. That's one. The second thing is it can handle pretty high and uh, energy input, say from a few watts to 25 watts. And we can make those and we feel pretty excited because if we can make them flexible, we can wrap electronics. We can wrap a lot of curved surfaces which need heat or thermal management. Now, you, I, I show here one figure. Basically, this is a Tesla pattern in terms of cooling layer battery. Okay, so remember the battery actually, say, say Tesla cars, right? The most important part is their battery, right? The battery, it carries a lot of weight because of the energy density problem. In the meantime, right, the fire of a lot of electrical cars. Actually, just last week, I remember there are that a couple of cars got burned, electrical car got burned. It's because of battery problem. Right? The battery layer, you have a lot of heat being generated and they need thermal management. And uh, this is a Tesla pattern. Basically, they pump the liquid in and the list have to be curved, basically flowing around. What we are thinking is if we have those flexible ones, we can potentially, potentially basically wrap the battery around and, uh, and can cool down the battery. That's, that's one thing we can, we can think. Right? So if we put these pieces together, right? I have high power ones and which can be used for IGBT or in water thermal management. And if I have other ones, then we can potentially say have thermal management for battery. And that means it's actually we do technologies that are the key parts for electrical vehicles in terms of thermal management. And we also make uh, the polymer TGPs or thermal ground plants, which are RF transparent. Right. You need to basically RF transparent means you cannot use metal. And uh, this is one device we make, we test them and uh, you can see it's, uh, it's, it's reasonably good in terms of, in terms of thermal management, but you can have very uniform temperature. So, so, so I think that's, that's the third part I want to talk and uh, because of time, I would like to just stop here and because I remember I started at 9.30 and uh, I, I would like to just stop here. And, uh, and uh, if you, I would- okay, Rong Gui, you still yeah. have some time. You can talk about the last part, okay. Yeah. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. All right, oh, go ahead. yeah, okay. So honestly, usually I put a slice together. I never, I, I never know how much time I use, <laughs> okay. So I, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about an, a topic I worked over the last, uh, say five, six years. It's called radiative cooling, actually about six years now, six, maybe six to seven years. And uh, the interesting part is just today, just today we published a paper in science, a review article in science is on radiative cooling. Essentially it reviews the topic, say why we are interested in this and what are the new advancements. It covers a lot of very high profile papers uh, published over the last few years. So because, because of time, I'm going to get this really fast, trying to articulate a couple of things. One is why we are interested in this. The other thing is what we made and the length, length I think I would show a couple of examples to say how, how, how they are used. All right, so I believe everybody knows global warming and I do not need to mention too much about this. Essentially, we are interested in say, how to better use energy, right? How to have better production of energy, which do not burn as much as we have in terms of fossil fuels. And then in the meantime, if we can have less, we can have less energy use and burn more efficiently. We hopefully has less CO2 emission and hopefully we have a better earth for everybody, including you and the polar bears, right? Now, we, we also know that, 
another part is the energy use. The energy use for air conditioner is horribly big amount. Actually, Professor Raman just talked about how to use IoT devices to have better monitoring and to have better use of energy. And actually, this is exactly on the same topic, same idea, same thinking. Right. If I know better what Professor Rama was making, I would make more on this part rather than the last part on electronics. Right. Now, actually, essentially, air conditioner use a lot of energy. Right. If you think about things about, say, today about global warming, we think two things: how to produce energy or electricity more efficiently. The other thing is how to use less energy, including ability. Of course, including air conditioning. Right? Now I show here because because honestly, I I stick in to US for eighteen years. I have I have better data on US rather than in China or the world. <laughs> okay, so I use this as a good example showing why we want why we want higher efficiency in terms of energy production. Also, we want to look into where those energy goes, right? Now, this is very popular shot. Most of big charts give talks using this slide. Basically shows thermal engineering is very important, right? Because most of the electricity are generated by thermal engineering. But I wanted to articulate one single point here in terms of electricity generation. For those who are who are thermal engineers or who has physics background, you know the efficiency of power production is dictated by so-called Carnot cycle. Carnot cycle means you have higher burning temperature, you have better efficiency. If you have lower damping waste heat temperature, you have higher efficiency. Right now, what we have is we damp the so-called waste heat about sixty percent of waste heat to what we have in your background, Earth, in Earth, on your Earth, right? It's atmosphere or lake. They have about 20 degrees, zero to 20 degrees C temperature, right? Now, if I open up my mind, if I say, what if I can dump the heat not on Earth, okay? I dump the heat to a space that is much lower temperature, you can immediately increase the power efficiency of heat engines. Okay, so how we are going to do it? That's one question, right? But I give you a very easy, very easy ideological, ideal question, right? Easy. And the second thing, the second thing is whatever I put on the figure here, about 20% of heat energy, about 20% of energy is used, or electricity is used for air conditioning systems, for heating and cooling, right? Today we are getting cold, but just a couple of months ago, we are talking about cooling. Right? It's a very high cooling load. Now, if you look into buildings, a lot of buildings have something called envelope material, right? Yellow windows or metallic structures, right? And a lot of air conditioning energy is essentially using, used, used to cool those solar heat gates, in other words, sunlight. Right? You have a lot of heat. Now, what if I can block those sunlight? Right? That's one. The other thing is, what if my building envelope structure can emit energy and directly to a cold space? Right? And if you have these questions get answered, and you can basically have higher efficiency in terms of heat engines, and you can have less air conditioning load. And that's the idea, right? Now, we, as I mentioned, we look into this problem and we usually look around our, ourselves. But if you look a little bit beyond what we have, is we know, we, know we, we all live on Earth. And this Earth here, we have sunlight. We have a lot of sunlight coming in. It's about 1,000 watt per meter square, right? And they come in as, visible and near infrared light. It's 300 nanometer to three micron wavelengths. Now in the meantime, 
we have we have atmosphere and because of that atmosphere keeps your temperature pretty stable from day and night that's one thing the second thing is if you go beyond the atmosphere and if you look at the earth they are very singular they are a point and the whole universe is essentially vacuum is a single point in a vacuum right and it's burning hot because because you have sunlight and they have to release the energy to the universe that universe is 3k and they release through infrared thermal radiation and because of that balance right you have heat gain from solar light and you can release to the universe you can make them a balance and that's the environment you live in right now if you look into the so-called global warming right very simple way actually a lot of people you know political papers are are big charts in terms of science technology community writing ways to potentially reduce global warming one way is if you can engineer in the surface of the earth right you can have better you can have better emission to the universe right you can either put a blanket on the earth so that they can black basically cover the sun they all have less sunlight and that's all possible right? and those are basically ideas thinking right now what we want to do is we try to make good use of this cold universe and try to make cooling right? so that's something called daytime radiative cooling essentially we try to block sunlight that's one the other thing is the atmosphere there is a, a good part of the atmosphere called a to 30 micron wavelengths uh infrared light does not interact with atmosphere and the length those basically say room temperature infrared light can pass through directly to through the atmosphere and go through directly to the universe right now if we can make a material we which can reflect sunlight well in the meantime we can have best emission at that particular wavelength we can potentially have a surface which has a lower temperature length ambient and that's the design criteria okay so people actually made this and actually about six or seven years ago Stanford uh focus actually who is uh, right now Sanfei Feng who is the co-author of the paper we published today is making this as photonic devices right photonic devices have very really good say solar reflectance and very really good uh, uh infrared emission at 8 to 13 micron and we can have lower temperatures about four degrees c lower unfortunately lists are not scalable because if you look at this it's ic it made, made through ic process okay circuit process so we basically come up with a good idea is making them into scalable into polymer systems so what you see is we have glass beads and inside the polymer we choose polymer carefully they are transparent to solar light in the meantime we have we have glass beads and polymer together and we have good resonance for getting 8 to 13 micron wavelengths and really have have very really good high emission so making those together we have really good solar reflectivity or really low solar absorptance and a really high atmospheric window emission and give you really low temperature what we have is essentially we can have a surface and have about right now we can make them about eight degrees c close to 10 degrees c lower than ambient temperature and have a power a power level about 100 watt per meter square to cool okay in other words if i have something like this as a blanket and we put under the sun it can cool down about 10 degrees c and then you have a power you can dampen the power density about 100 watt per meter square so after actually after our paper there are a lot of different papers uh, published in really high profile journals in terms of making paints making structured materials making glass like materials so we actually review pretty well on how how, how those materials are made and then we can make different applications right in terms of buildings 
right? In terms of in terms of say, for example, say say <coughs> cabinet cabinet for 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 electronics and uh, even for for even for say camping, right? So so the list the rest of figure basically shows we we make those materials and we can deploy into different systems. And I think the really last one also close to the so-called wearables is we can make something like tents and the they, they can call can get in pretty cold or cool basically about inside the tent can be about 15 degrees C, 10 to 15 degrees C lower than the regular tents, right? And we also can make basically a hedge and uh, those are pretty good deal in terms of personal cooling. And if if I come back, say something called IoT or wearable, and these are something I believe they are closely connected. As I mentioned, when I make slides, I try to make them connecting to what your advertisement look like. And uh, we also try to make them into say heat sink for, for, for other things. Now, I, I think I would use this slide to summarize. What I started is I try to make a connection to those who are not so experienced in heat transfer. And I talk about simple heat transfer things. Then I talk about thermal engineering or thermal management for high power electronics and uh, wearable electronics. And the last piece, I'm sorry, I don't have enough time. And I only talk about, I believe 12 minutes in terms of radiative cooling. We actually published uh, uh, about, about uh, 10 plus papers in radiative cooling in terms of original material. And I believe right now, I can claim that two best reviews are published by us. One is in Applied Physics Reviews, which was published 2019. It's very really thick. I believe it's a 50 printed pages. And today in science is six pages. In other words, we cover almost every topic in terms of fundamentals, materials, Everybody make materials. If those materials are meaningful, useful, or high profile, we try to cover it and the length applications. With that, I, I thank everybody for listening to me and uh, I would uh, be happy to uh, answer any questions. All right, uh, thanks Professor Yang for the very uh, exciting talk. Uh, very interesting. So uh, we indeed have a number of questions. So uh, the first question is for the mass fabrication of micro nano structural surface. Uh, could you please compare the different fabrication method and their cost? Basically, pros and cons of different ways we make these uh, uh, surfaces. Right. Well, this is honestly this is the most tough question. I, I would ever get, right? So, so for example, when we make the so-called micro nanostructure surfaces for, 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 for thermal management, right? For, 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 for thermal management, essentially, I would say right now, right now, almost everybody in our academic society is trying to make a surface and try to show, okay, I have enhancement. And usually they try to compare the enhancement with just plain surfaces or compare to certain really regular surfaces and try to show data. Right now it's more or less in collecting data rather than comparing those fab fabrication methods and the cost. That's, that's one, that's the reality, right? But in the meantime, in the meantime, in industry, Right, there are a few common ways to make right single the couple uh, particles, right? Making micro channels right? through mechanical ways, right? And uh, and uh, then, 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 then even fancy ways, right? Using lithography ways, the the cost can be very different. Honestly, the cost can be very different, and uh, the sintering way is the easiest. And if you can. If you can utilize any of the elements already commercially available, you can make them cheaper and maybe detailing a little bit about the performance. Right? For example, sintered copper powder, and that's the easy way. Everybody can sinter it. 
Like what we just make is centered couple mesh because we can buy meshes by me tens thousands of meters, right? And they will center it and you, you can make it easy. But if you go through micro fabrication through lithography, that's going to be expensive. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So let's move on to your next question, which is uh, also related to the uh, fabrication. So the question here is, for the uh, uh, 3D hierarchical uh, uh, surface with micro mesh, uh, what is the material you use to make these uh, structures? Uh, do you use silicon or polymer? And uh, can you quickly comment on the fabrication process? Right. Yeah, yeah, nice. So, so this one actually is, we use a uh, couple micro mesh. Mm -hmm. And uh, we when we make those, we have Different, we can buy different sizes of mesh, right? And in terms of, say, they call line numbers, in terms of the density of those, those mesh. And, uh, and then we, we use uh, thermal diffusion bonding. Mm -hmm. Thermal diffusion bonding. And this one actually related back to the first question about the cost. Yeah. I mean, if, you can, if you can use some common elements, like what we have now is couple mesh. And we actually do very fast one step, some more diffusion bonding and uh, and uh, latch the surface, and then we can test it. Now there are details in terms of what's the vacuum level, right? And what's the temperature? And what's the what's the time duration? And those we don't disclose. I see. All right. Thanks. So the next question is pretty much still related to the uh, second one and the first one. Uh, basically, they're asking how to fabricate mesh on the structural surface. I guess they mean uh, uh, structured surface. So, yeah, structural but, surface, basically, you can think about structural surface in two ways. Like one is like what we show in a picture is like a micro channels or micro pillows, right? Now, if you your pillow is large enough, right, you can match you have mesh, it's, it's denser than that, and you can still do some more diffusion bonding. And that's what we do. Now, there are other, other things, for example, people can talk about structured surface as a curved surface. Mm -hmm. Then you need to think about how to how to put it on curved surface. Do we actually have that? Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to your next question. So uh, this one is basically, um, this is towards the application of these technologies. Uh, so the question is, uh, they remember um, heat transfer is very important for cell phone and other things. So uh, there was a big issue of Samsung cell phone battery problem a few years ago. I remember that was back in 2016. So FAA had a ban on yeah. Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Uh, we cannot take these phones on the plane because the battery could overheat. Indeed, I remember even before that, uh, the battery of uh, Boeing 787 also have this overheating problem. So uh, the question is, is your TTP uh, already commercialized? And uh, uh, do you see that you can apply this technology towards solving some of these battery overheating problems? Yeah, yeah, very, very nice question. Yes, so the answer is yes. Uh, we formed, uh, I and my colleague uh, formed a company called Kevin Somo. Uh, Okay. Seven eight years ago, and it's commercialized, and okay. uh, and uh, and uh, we we actually we actually uh, have first of all we have a lot of patents, we have a lot of prototypes, mm -hmm. and we actually early on about uh, four or five years ago we even work with uh, a Japanese company to make those prototypes, and uh, also send to many many smartphone companies. Right now, I actually, I, I had the one figure on one slide, I, I said something maybe too fast that people don't catch. We work with this company, Taiwanese company called Foscom, and it's mass producing us. Right. I believe a couple of months ago, we sent out about 2000 pieces, 2000 okay. pieces to different smartphone companies. And in terms of who are the smartphone companies, indeed, all major players. Very oh. nice. Very nice. So um, last but not least, uh, the question is, uh, the fifth question is for the TGP. 
um, if you scale it up to a larger size, for example, uh, cover the entire floor with it, or use it as a wallpaper covering the entire wall, uh, what can you say about the cost uh, when you scale it up? And uh, what's the major challenge when we try to scale up this technology? Yeah, so, so, so this is, this is a, a question interesting not. First of all, first of all, right, right now, like what we do in terms of TGP, right? We actually, I talk about two different pieces of TGP. One is thicker ones for high powers. The mm -hmm. other thinner ones for like smartphones, right? So in terms of cost for smartphones, we, we actually, as I mentioned, we have, we have, we have tried to make them into commercial and we actually have estimates for, for the cost and it's comparable. It's, okay. it's compatible to regular thermal management for smartphones. Of course, it's the future generation technology. It can be twice or three times of what the thermal management solution right now is. Right. But I do want to tell exactly it's 10 times or five times, right? Or two times. Right. That's that's the one. Right? Now the other thing is how do you scale up? Right? If it's thin, if it's thin, you would not use one single pitch to scale up. Right. It's very clear because because it's the inside is called weak structure. Weak structure, if you have a long distance, they cannot, right? They cannot survive, they cannot work. Right? So you have to scale up through different small pieces, small pieces, you pile it up. Right? Now, if it's very thin ones, you usually use small size to, to, to pile up. If it's larger ones, you can scale up into, in, into uh, thicker ones, you can, you can use larger piles to scale up. Right? You can make, if you make, say for example, mm -hmm. three mil millimeter thick, each of the piece, you can make them as large as my laptop size, or oh. even larger than that, and then you can pile up, right? So this actually, this actually remind me one, one particular research topic, I actually, a few years ago, people are interested in. It's about vertical flight, right? Vertical flight, when they take off, they have a big bloom and it's heating up the deck. And yeah. people are thinking about thermal management. You can think about using similar things to cool the deck. Oh, okay. And that's how you can, you can consider. I see. All right, thanks uh, for the answers. And also thanks for all the questions. So Alice, uh, you have the podium now. Okay, thank you, Zhenghui, very much, and thank you, Zhongkui. I'm really looking forward for the cooling clothes. Yeah, I mean, that will be very helpful. So, Zhongkui, as you know, I present this certification to you. So, I can ask you connect the world and the universe by your nice technology, right? Now, you really, you know, connect world and universe by your cooling, you know, radiation cooling technology. We're looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so that's end of today. So next week we're going to have two very nice speakers here. It's for brain science. Uh, both of them are very famous. One was Ed Boyd. Uh, he was a nature editor about the optical genetics. So uh, he's also a genius. I see many people maybe read his articles, also heard his uh, TED talks. He gave uh, several TED talks, so all very popular. So Boyden will be here next week. He's going to talk about his latest result for the brain technology and how to see all these tissues by his special you know, uh, techniques. And uh, Annie Andrew was, uh, famous female, you know, scientist in UCLA has also very famous for study of the neuroscience. So that's why she's going to discuss about, you know, his latest, her latest results in the neuroscience. <coughs> so we're looking forward to have all of them and stay with us. I can add the talk and do remember to deliver this service 
yeah, and return that to me as soon as possible. So I can add the task that has a lot of scientists as here. So meeting the top scientists, uh, I can add the task. So every week we're waiting here for you, eight o'clock in Beijing and also, you know, in the whole world. So see you next week. That's all of today. Bye bye. Okay, well.